Um, I gave this talk once before at CppCon. And I'll admit that I flew through it because it was like 200 slides in 40 something minutes. And I'm trying to purposely go through slower and in more detail, not so you understand, but you, so that you feel the pain of lock free programming, of having to be aware of every detail on every line of code. So, um, because my general guide to threaded coding is to use locks. You shouldn't be doing lock three programming. Um, it's difficult, it's not correct most of the time. Uh, it's a lot simpler to use locks. Uh, so thus, talk is over, everyone go home. Um, but uh, you know, a further bigger guide is uh, forget about, you know, in kindergarten you learned how to share. Stop sharing data when you're doing algorithms across threads. Use locks when you do have some sharing. Measure your algorithm, measure it again, because the first time you measured it, you got it wrong. It always happens. And then change your algorithm, go back to one, and remeasure, stop, try not to share so much. And notice you do this infinitely. Lock free down here at infinity is the last thing you ever want to do. And it's only once you've measured so much and you say, we really got a bottleneck, we really have to do something here. And then don't forget after you've done the lock free to measure and measure again, because it doesn't mean it's going to be faster. There's lock, people have done lock free stuff. There's, there's studies on categories of problems that if you do lock free, they can show like in theory, it will never be faster, right? So don't, don't think it's going to fix your, your performance problems. Not sharing data will fix a lot of your performance problems. So don't share and use locks if you have to share. Um, throughout this talk, I'm going to say CAS because that's what I used to always call it. But I mean compare exchange in the, the standard weak or strong compare exchange. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out which one I should be using in the right spot. Also, CAS fits on slides. Compare exchange weak or compare exchange strong doesn't fit on slides very well. Uh, CAS was com uh, compare and swap or some, you know, is what that used to be called. That's why it's CAS. Uh, and, you know, when you see all this code crammed into a slide, I don't normally code like that, but I'm trying to fit it all on slides here. Oh, yeah. I think, I think that was supposed to be a note for me, not, not put on the slide. Um, I'm not an expert in lock-free programming. I've actually now given, you know, a lot of talks on it, so it, people start to think I'm an expert. But to be an expert on it, you really have to be doing this every day. And then I don't think you should be doing this every day, so I don't do this every day at work. Uh, it's a fun thing to do at home. It's a fun hobby for <coughs> sadistic people. Um, so although I dabble in it, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in it, and um, there's not many experts in it. So what I'm trying to do today is one example, one lock-free queue, and basically this image here is going to get burned onto my monitor because every slide has this image in it. Um, but here's a simple, the idea of what a, what a queue is in general, right? You've got things coming in one side and things taken out on the other side. And maybe if it's a thread safe queue, you've got different threads that are pushing and, and popping. Um, and I'm not going to go around and color all my things here. If you see arrows, it means different threads. It doesn't mean they're the same thread or something like that if they're the same color. Um, so that, even though they're the same color, that's still two different threads, okay? And so this is, you know, uh, multiple reader uh, consumer threads and we could have multiple producer threads and then this is of course a multi-producer multi-consumer queue which gets shortened to MP MCQ if you go read up about this kind of stuff um, and it doesn't matter really what the internals of this thing looks like as long as it's got multiple threads on both sides that's a multi-producer multi-consumer queue you can have all the other variants right and if any case when you're using a uh, uh, a thread safe queue, if you know that you only have one, uh, s a single consumer and multiple producers or whatever, which the case you know, pick the right queue for that case because if I know I only have one on one side and multiple on the other side, I would do the queue differently because there's different optimizations you can do. But the one I want to talk about is the, the hardest one, the multi on both sides. Um, there's another name I have for this queue and I purposely drew the diagram to evoke the name in, in you know, what, what does this queue look like, you know, to anyone? A funnel. A funnel. Good. Yes. Close. I call it bottleneck. Because <laughs> right? as I said, you shouldn't be sharing data. If you have a bunch of threads producing data and a bunch of threads that want to uh, consume that data, 
why shove them all through one spot, right? You would be better off with separate queues that never talk to each other and keep your data separate, you know, maybe one thread on each side and you could make a simpler queue and you could never share and you'd get less contention. Um, the only problem with this is that same thing that happens at work sometimes, one guy's doing all the work and everyone else is sitting around doing nothing, right? So you'd have to, if you did something like this, you would have to balance your work somehow and you get this kind of thing where it's like mostly single threaded, but if necessary, you, you'll steal work from other people. And this is a very interesting, you know, direction to go down. A lot of people are working on what's the best way to do stuff like that. But just for fun, let's do this single queue that all threads can access from both sides. <coughs> And so let's tear away uh, the outer edge of this thing and dig into what it looks like on the inside. Basically, it's a queue, has a head and a tail. And if you didn't notice by the diagram, I really mean it is a fixed buffer. There's no node, it's not a node based queue. It's a contiguous memory queue of some size, and it's got a head and a tail. And I don't really care right now whether you think of head and tail as pointers or indexing, whatever. It doesn't really make a difference, at least not yet. Um, and uh, tail is pointing, you know, you can decide what, how you want tail to be, but in my stuff, tail is always pointing to the next available and head is pointing to the, fir you know, the next available spot for a <coughs> producer and head is always pointing to the first available one for a consumer. So if this was just a normal queue, you would just do this simple push, right? Increment tail, set the value, uh, and leave. But of course, that's not thread safe. So we can't do that. Because now if we have two threads coming in at the same time, what's gonna happen here, right? They're both trying to write to this location, right? So what do you think the possible outcomes, what will you get in these spots? Right? You could, if you're lucky, get A and B. You could just as easily get B and A. Right? Just whoever shows up first kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, the way it's written right now, you could also get B and A just disappeared. Right? And how that happens is, what happens is A came in, uh, incremented, let me see if I get this right. A came in and incremented tail. B came in at the same time, read the old tail, uh, so B overwrote A, and then you think they both increment tail, but they're not going to reread tail after they've got the, like tail will be in, in a register, so they'll actually just set tail to the same value. Okay, doesn't matter exactly if you, if you see how that happens, but that can happen, and this can happen. And does anyone see any other possible outcomes of what could happen there? If A and B is bigger than a machine word, you can get part of A and part of B. Yes. Um, I'm going to say yes to whatever you suggest <laughs> as to what can happen here. Why is that? It's undefined behavior. Your cat can get pregnant. Uh, that's Marshall. Marshall's, that's Marshall's quote. Uh, because our, we're imagining our thing here are just ints and size T and stuff like that. There's no atomic variables here, so we can't be uh, reading and writing them from two threads at the same time. <coughs> that's a data race, that's undefined behavior. So how do we fix the undefined behavior? Undefined behavior. Um, we throw atomic at it. We throw atomic at things as if it's free and it's nowhere near free, but it's like pixie dust. You throw atomic at all these and suddenly all your undefined behavior goes away. And then the question is, does this, does this work? I mean, at least it's not undefined, but what, what can happen now? Interesting thing that happens now is the tail plus plus happens first and whoever increments it first reserves this space. And once he's reserved that space, the other guy will never write to there. He'll write to the next space, right? And because they're both racing on this atomic thing, they'll never get the same tail, okay? So that's kind of nice. We've reserved our spots. Does the buffer have to be atomic? You don't actually, they're not both writing to the same location in the buffer. <coughs> did you read my slides? Uh, I did not. <laughs> I published the papers on a lot of this stuff here, so this is, turns out to be one of the harder problems. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's why I picked it. I probably got a lot of it wrong at the end. Like it, it's, it's, we'll see when we go along. Um, uh, so, so the question basically is, does buffer need to be atomic if only one thread is going to write this one and the other thread is going to write that one because we've reserved our spots? So there's a slide, a couple slides ahead I show that no, it doesn't, buffer doesn't have to be atomic in this case. But, oh, it's the next slide. <laughs> because we're only now contending on tail, that's where the race is, buffer doesn't have to be atomic. Awesome. Um, so we can get A and B written out. Or we can get B and A written out. We're kind of happy. Anyone happy? Anyone not happy? Yes? Uh, go the, uh, oh, the go beyond the array? Like, yeah, I mean, that, that's, I've got dot, dot, dots. Who knows how, how big this array is? That's a whole nother, whole nother problem. I'm not going to even worry about that one yet. Yes? Start reading before you finish writing. The head. Yeah, the head can come in. It, yeah, I'll repeat the question. The, the, his, his comment was that head can come in and start reading B if it, if it runs ahead there and reads B before maybe it reads half of B, which would make maybe we have to make B atomic again, or the, the buffer atomic again. Um, besides even those problems, just forget, maybe we never read out of this buffer. Maybe we, all I'm trying to do is get push to work. Push still doesn't work yet. Um, and if, <coughs> if only I could remember why push doesn't work yet. We'll look, we'll, we'll see. Um, oh, no, it is. It, I'm, yeah, the next problem is the, uh, is Pac-Man comes along and wah, 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 you know, gets, gets to here. And, and he's on this last one and he's about to read that one, then he's going to go to the next one, right? So there's, you know, all the X's are being read out of the buffer. And tail, meanwhile, has moved along. So as far as head's concerned, He's probably thinking that he can keep going because he's not reached tail yet. But, you know, there might be something here, but there's nothing here yet. So head is just going to read, read, you know, uninitialized memory or something like that, whatever's lying around. <coughs> right? So head just steps forward another step, and we're back into undefined behavior land. And Pac-Man's not happy anymore. Um, but now, I kind of made an assumption there that head, even if there's no, even if no pushing is going on, why do I think head will never get past tail, all right? Um, like, you know, I just forget about pushing, I just want to prevent this from happening. Um, how can we detect that? So maybe we just check, is head less than tail, all right? Always make sure head is less than tail and then we'll never, you know, other than this push problem, but if, if things aren't being pushed right now, just don't uh, eat, eat uh, entries past the tail. Well, I can't do that. <coughs> Head's atomic, it's an atomic variable. Tail's an atomic variable, but comparing the two of them at the same time is not atomic. Um, because, you know, I read this one. After I've read it, I have to read that one. This may have changed in the, in the meantime. So I can't just read two variables at the same time with an atomic <laughs> operation. There's you know, depending on your hardware, there's, you know, esoteric hardware maybe has re two reads that are atomic, but, or if you put them, if you put them side by side in memory, you can maybe get, a t you know, two reads atomic. But basically that's not atomic. And then even if it was atomic, even if I magically had an atomic less compares two variables and says, yes, head is less than tail. Therefore, go ahead and read head. Did I say the word then? You know, if head is less than tail, then read head. Then is a bad word. Then is a four-letter word in <coughs> atomic uh, uh, lock-free programming. Because even if you could say that, look, head is less than tail, and then you go, I'm going to do something about that. Well, head's not less than tail anymore. It was less here. You know, maybe you could tell what the state of the world was here. The state of the world is not the same anymore in your next line of code, right? And that is. Um, is a fundamental problem of we're so used to that. We're so used to the thing inside the if block that the condition's not going to change once I get inside the if block. You can't do that anymore. So there's that then, and then we have this other then, right? Re read head, then read tail. That's, there's a then hiding in that, right? Of course, then you're going to say, well, you know, this is what coding is. Coding is statement one, then statement two, then statement three. 
So how can you do any lock-free programming at all if you're worried about the word then? And basically this is why lock-free programming is hard. Um, you can get away with statements one after the other when the statements are using local variables. It's when you start touching your shared variables, variables that are shared across threads, that you have to worry about read head then read tail because that first read is old and useless now. So basically between two lines of code you can't assume the state that you just looked at. Whatever you thought was the state of the world, that's not the state of the world anymore when you get to your next line of code. So how do we ever get anywhere? But basically my diagram should look like this. Right? If you say, let's read head, okay, read head, what's the rest of the diagram look like? I have no idea. I can't see the rest of the diagram. I can only see one variable at a time. Great, let's read head. Now let's read tail. Okay, what's the rest of, I don't know. I don't know what head looks like anymore because now I'm reading tail. So get that through your mind of, you have no idea. All that you can know basically in lock-free programming is 32 bits usually, or if you're in a 60-bit, 4-bit platform, you have a 64-bit atomic. But that's, you know, you've got 32 or 6, you've got an integer that you can look at at any time. You know, often that's it. Yes? So is it even possible to read half an int? I mean, like... Reading half an int? Um, yeah. Depends on your platform. You could have a, you know, 16-bit platform that, well, int, int is almost always, um, you know, the native, the nice size. Um, I guess the correct term yeah, machine, but you know, even on a x86, you don't have to align your ints to four byte boundaries. You can spread your int over, you know, un unaligned memory, and then it's going to do two reads on it. Atomic uh, ensures that it's aligned. Yes? No? No, you can't. It has four byte alignment. Is that recent? Yes. Uh, Chandler, who knows these things, int, int has four byte alignment. Yeah, he's answering that C++ now says int has four byte alignment. C++ ABI on x86, on every x86 C++ ABI requires them to be four byte alignment. What about some other platform? Does int always have to be a... ABI also says int four byte alignment. Forget the ABI, the better question is the C++ memory model can be defined in one byte alignment. This is not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, so in the language, basically, the language says if you're, you know, it basically says it's not atomic unless you use atomics, right? Don't don't make an assumption in, about it unless it's so. But anyhow, yes. So if the memory is aligned, does this reading mind integer guarantee that the memory is precise? That's that's basically the same. Yeah, that's the question is, can you just read an integer when it's not atomic and know that you got you got it read all at once? You didn't get half a read. Technically, by the spec, you can't do that. Or yeah, uh, you know, maybe there's like, yes, Chandler's, Chandler can answer this better than me. Technically, you cannot do that. And there are actual tools that will cause it to fail. It is a valid and conforming implementation of C++ to take a non-atomic integer read and split it up into a byte-wise read. And you can imagine an actual implementation doing this if you wanted a software implementation of a different Indianness than your underlying hardware, for right. example. Or they get optimized. So to repeat what Chandler said is, no, you can't guarantee that an uh, integer read is a single read that's atomic. It might read all four bytes individually over a period of time. Um, so anyhow, whenever we're reading stuff, we can only read one thing at a time, and we can read one thing at a time because it's atomic. So we can't assume the state. So what are we going to do about head getting past tail? Um, and the other way I think of, of this, by the way, is every state is a good state. Whatever line of code I'm on, the state in my head of what this diagram looks like has to be valid for that line of code. And that's, this diagram could be in any state, and that line of code has to be good with that, right? Because another thread could be changing the state on me. So I can't go, well, it's in this state now, it's not going to be in that other state. No, it might be in any state. Every state has to be good for the line of code you're looking at. Um, I don't know what I was going to say there. Yeah, here's the part about, you know, normal code, you do this. If some state, this mu some state must still be true, right? 
and then you can do some stuff. Lock-free code, you can't make that assumption. And the problem is that you're so used to doing this. Like even though I know I can't do this when I'm doing lock-free coding, I still do it because it's just automatic. You just forget that you're not allowed because you've been doing this your whole life, right? Um, the other thing that you're used to doing is in member functions, you break your invariance inside the member function, you do whatever you need to do, and then you restore your invariance. With uh, like a lock-free queue or something, you still have invariants that you don't expose to the outside world, but your invariants are always exposed to the other threads that are inside other member functions. So in a sense, you can't break invariants at any time. So that's, that's more fun. So, I, you know, a lock-free programmer has to wear his state on his sleeve. You can't just hide your state anywhere. Like wearing your heart on his sleeve. So, we can't do this. We can't just compare head to tail and say, I'm not going to go past tail. So what in the world can we do instead? I've got an idea. We're going to do head less than tail. I know I just said we can't do that, but we're going to do it anyhow. How can we do that? What we're going to do is ensure tail is always increasing. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to read head, and then we're going to read tail, and we're going to say, well, head was less than tail a minute ago. So as long as head's not moving, head is still less than tail. Right? Tail can keep going as far as it wants, but it's always going to be greater. Now, how, you know, tail will someday overflow or wrap around or something, but, um, you know, if it's a 64-bit value uh, and I'm adding items to my queue one every second, you know, maybe you're faster than that, but let's, you know, we're adding items to the queue one every, every second. How big is 2 to the 64 seconds? 42 times the length of the universe, time that, that the universe has existed. Okay? So that's a long time. And 42 is probably because it's that, that magic answer to the life meaning of the universe. So somehow 2 to the 64 is tied into the number 42. Um, so we can get away with, hopefully, if we do it right, that tail never decreases, tail always increases. And like you mentioned before, our buffer's gonna, we're, you know, our buffer's not infinite. Our buffer's not 2 to the 64. So we will eventually have to do something, you know, worry about the end, but in, in um, the value inside of tail can go beyond the buffer for now. So Pac-Man's happy because he will look and say, I'm, I'm less than tail I can read. I'm, I'm less than what tail was, so something must be there because only, tail only moves forward if something gets, gets put there. So I'm kind of happy. I won't go, pa I, I will at least stay behind tail. Yeah? Well, because that's exactly this. That's what, what that's what... Head could be incremented. By, the question is, uh, how do we know that head doesn't overtake tail? I mean, this is the guy who's going to increment head. The guy who reads. Yes. And he's not going to read or eat anything. Uh, he'll only read one thing here. He knows he's at least one behind. Because he's less than tail. So, so, we're not looking at multiple consumers yet? Yeah, for now, let's... I mean... When it's multiple consumers, they're each going to do the same checking. So, it, it might, it, it, the, the, one of the problems of this whole thing is how do you show push before showing pop and how do you show pop before showing push? So, for now, let me wave my hands and say that, you know, trust me that head, head's not going to get past tail. Yeah? Okay. Nile? Yeah. What, what tail can be yeah, yes, tail can be incremented more times before the stuff's written. We still have that problem. Yes. And that's the problem I'm trying to get to. Uh, you know, I just wanted to make sure that head doesn't get even if nothing's being pushed, I don't want head to go too far. So let's imagine that head won't go past tail if nothing's being pushed. But then we still have this problem of this case where tail got ahead but it didn't write yet. So that's why I'm trying to say let's just handle this case. So we th we're, we're hoping that head less than tail will take care of that, but it obviously doesn't take care of this case because tail is incremented before the write. And Pac-Man will now still read off the end, and he's still unhappy. 
So the problem here is that, you know, we've got, tail needs to do two things, right? It needs to be where are we going, and it also has to be keeping head from going anywhere. Um, and the other way you could try is, we, you know, we, you, you could try writing first and then incrementing tail. But that's basically, then we don't get the reservation system, so we can't really do that either. We're, we're kind of stuck. So let's split tail into two parts. <coughs> There's the, you know, leading edge of tail and the trailing edge of tail, or the head of tail and the tail of tail. Uh, this, I think I, S and E, I think it's start and end of tail, left and right of tail, whatever. Um, so let's give tail two parts. And then head will stay on this side of the first edge of tail. So what we're going to do now is increment the, 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 you know, the reservation system of tail, which is this part, to reserve our spot. Uh, and then we'll write, and then we'll move the other edge of the, of the thing. Okay? So if we come in... Hmm? I... Yeah, uh, uh, you know what? I have races and bugs for the, the you know, whenever I say, is this good? Is this, you think this works yet? <laughs> Just say no. Okay? But this is what I mean, this is my point. When you're doing lock reprogramming, you think of an idea, you start writing it down, you start thinking it through, you think, okay, this might work. Then you go, oh, it doesn't work in this case. Then you go, okay, well, I'll take care of that case. And, you know, I'll try another case. So I, I'm, I'm putting you through the pain of trying all, all the trial and error. So what happens here is A comes in, then just thread A. He's right here now. He hasn't incremented anything yet, so tail is, you know, concise. And then he increments tail, makes the reservation. He writes to it, and then he fixes up the tail. Okay, that's the idea. But B can come in, and we can be here still. You know, A has incremented. B also incremented the reservation system. And uh, B is written before A. But we're okay because, you know, that was the problem we had, was this empty spot. We're okay because this hasn't moved yet. And then tail moves it on, uh, B moves it on us before A did. Right? So we haven't yet solved our problem. Right? Um, so we really want to be careful with who is incrementing that, that other edge. Yeah, S, S was here, and it went there, right? It's not, it hasn't met, it hasn't reached uh, the other edge yet. So let's do this. We come in and we basically say, if we are the guy here, we line, you know, we've reserved this spot, we line up with the edge, we're the one who's going to, to fix up the trailing edge. Okay, so A finally gets put, you know, so B will just ignore that and B won't, won't update things. A will come in and he'll update things because he's the guy who's on that reserve spot. Oh, I said then again, didn't I? I've got an if statement in there, I've got a then. Is that okay? Right, for every time you have a then, you've got to look at this and go, is this okay? What's, you know, how can I be sure that when I have, I check some state here, and then I'm going to assume that state is still true. How do I know no one else is modifying tail when I'm inside of here? Tail.s. Tail.s, yeah. How do I know I can mess with tail.s and no one else is messing with tail.s, basically, is what I'm asking. Yeah, only this guy. We've reserved this spot. There's only one person who can ha have temp equals that, that spot, you know? When I get that spot, I have reserved tail.s for me. No one else gets it. And we also said that tail goes on forever. So it'll never, it'll never, you know, we'll never just roll over tail and someone else will happen to be in the same spot. What about the else case? Yeah, what about the else case? Yeah. You need a wild cast, right? Man, I should go faster because maybe you guys have the right answer. So. That then is okay. That's all, you know, just one step at a time here. That then is okay. But now, it, where is it going to set tail? It's exactly kind of the question you guys are asking. He wants to just increment tail to here, but then we don't know if B has been by here yet or not. 
So B might have left, right? There was no else, there was no else here for, the, for B to come by and say, well, I'm not the main guy. He just left. He said, I can't update tail. I'm getting out of here. So is it's, maybe it's A's job to update tail completely, right? Problem is he has no idea whether he can update tail because he doesn't know whether B is there or not. How, how can he know whether B is there or not? He can't, really. So let's make a compromise. So far, this is a queue of ints, basically. That's all I'm trying to do. So let's say it's a queue of ints that aren't equal zero. Because zero, you know, n unimportant number. I know I said all numbers were interesting yesterday. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you imagine this could, could evolve into a queue of pointers, then, you know, null pointer, kind of special. Maybe you don't have nulls inside your queue. Um, and basically, lock-free programming, this is what you do. You make compromises everywhere. So now what we're going to do, when we're wondering if B is there or not, we can look to see if there's a zero here or not. If there's a zero, B hasn't shown up yet. If there's not a zero, there's something there, then we know B has already left and we have to clean up for, for the other threads. So we can come in, we can do our increment, we can check the buffer and say, if, as long as things are in the buffer, we just keep cleaning up the tail. Now, it's not necessarily obvious, but our reservation system where, like you mentioned, only one guy ever touched one slot, one thread like B might be setting that value and A is checking to see if B has shown up yet. So these two are racing on the same location, the same buffer location. Which means now that buffer again has to become atomic. Which kind of sucks because atomics are nowhere near free. They're, they're faster than locks. Has it? Well, it might die, maybe. Or has it been off the whole time? <laughs> okay. Uh, basically, um,
There we go. Uh, yes. A real question from someone who is. <coughs> uh, so, for what little I know, uh, spin locks are bad, and this looks much like a spin lock. Uh, so, is there anything that makes this different from a spin lock? This is a good question. The question is, this looks like a spin lock. How is this different than a spin lock? I'm going to say it's different, and you're ahead of me again. There's a slide. Sorry, I didn't mean it. No, it's fine. It's awesome. <laughs> this is, I should like cue people as to when I want that question and be like, next slide. Bam, there's the answer. Um, I don't even know where it is. I know it's in here somewhere. But for now, I'll say it's slightly different than a spin lock, and there's good reasons, very important reasons why it's different. OK? So it's just it's simply not universally true that spin locks are bad. I mean, there's yeah, that's the, types that's, of applications. That's the other part. Spin locks aren't always bad, right? Spin locks have their use. Uh, they're just mostly bad. <laughs> macros are evil, so but th are they they have our, they have things. Um, I'm going to do like the, the 10 second recap for the for the audio. Really, 10 seconds. <coughs> we we're here. We're trying to figure out whether these if statements are correct or not. Uh, a is incrementing, moving the thing along. B comes in. It can hit the same spot as A. B falls into this if statement when it shouldn't. So we're going to put a CAS in there so that we can handle both A and B in, being inside this this thing. These are the same if statements, so we can collapse that like that. So here's where we are. Um, and your point is? We're back to a race condition. We're back to a race condition. Um, which one? Because the, the predicate for the while is, is reading. They're both reading, they're, they're reading <laughs> the same buffers. What? They're, they're both reading the same buffers. They both might get the same answer. But only one of them will succeed on the CAS, I think. Uh, <coughs> I have at least one person nodding his head. I don't know, because you know, I'm OK, because you know what? This code's going to change again. So, Yes? I'm sorry if I missed something, but I feel like the meaning of the buffer changed at some point, where the tail used to point to the end, and now we're looking at a zero terminated buffer. Ask me in a few slides. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good point. The meaning of the buffer has changed, right? We, were we started out looking at head and tail to figure out where things are. But now the buffer is starting to gain knowledge of, of you know, basically where the zero is, is that where tail is, right? And that's what we're doing here is moving along, trying to find, trying to put tail in the right spot by looking at the buffer. So head and tail aren't really the, the uh, horse's mouth as to the head tail information. The buffer itself is the source of head and tail. The other problem here is that the side effect of current swap is that it updates so that your second argument to tell you what the current value is. Yeah, actually yes. So the point here is that the standards version of, of compare exchange, which I mean I should be writing tail dot s dot compare exchange. You know, I'm writing like old style C. Sorry. Um, the standard version uh, updates this value if it fails. Because it says temp doesn't equal tail.s, but I'll let you know what tail.s really was very recently. You know, why did it fail? So I'm not really using that yet. So that, I'll just say my macro doesn't do that for now. Sorry. Probably should have mentioned that somewhere. Um, so I am a little concerned about two, both of these th threads fighting each other. <coughs> They're both. Uh, there's a lot of contention on tail, and there's a lot of contention on the buffer, because they're both trying to update. So one thing we can do is, when the CAS fails, you just leave. You're just like, I didn't update tail. Someone else is updating tail. <coughs> because you know, if no one else is doing anything, this succeeds. It only fails if someone else updated it. So if someone else updated, R is false for me, I will just leave and let the other guy finish up. Okay. And then you don't have two threads fighting to update the tail. Um, so there's the two versions of that, right? One, there's less fighting between the two. This one, they both fight to get the job done. Which is better? Am I still? Which bug is bothering you? <laughs> Kind of hard to 
Well, well, let's just go on. Yeah. There, you know, his point was neither are correct, which might be true. Uh, f so for now, let's just look at what, you know, which, if we can get the rest of it right, which strategy is better? One thread doing the job and the other threads leaving, or both threads trying to do the same job at the same time? One thread? What if a thread dies? No. Well, so you're saying, you know, if the, this is the thing. This is the, I, and it's <coughs> another one of these. I think the slide's farther along, but whatever. The thing about lock free programming is it's not just that it's lock free and maybe it's faster and stuff, it's more robust. As I mentioned, every state at all times is a good state for the queue. So if one thread dies, it should be fine. Right? That's what we want. That's a good lock free, free algorithm. Yeah, we might, we, with, with the, this leading edge, we might be reserving a spot that never gets written to. Yeah, that's a later slide. Um, so I'm going to claim that this is better because of that very answer of if, if the threat, if you, if you have, uh, sorry, that's weird. Um, if you say only one thread's going to clean up and that thread dies, it never gets cleaned up. This case, if one thread dies, another thread will, will finish the job. What? If both threads die, the next thread that comes in and tries to add something will hopefully do the job. Hmm? The queue could be full. Maybe I should go faster. Um, so what happens if A pauses right here so, you know, we've got a zero there now. We're in this state. And the other threads keep going, right? Bunch of consumer threads that are all adding stuff to the queue. But this one guy just kind of took a break for a week. Is that OK? Right? It, it might be OK because really, is it going to pause for a week? No, it's going to pause momentarily, and then it'll finish its job. But like. Someone might kill your threads. We shouldn't go around killing threads, but whatever. It's not like it's going to crash there, hopefully. <laughs> well, if that one thread swaps the disk. Well, if he doesn't access, that's on the page, not disk. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully, you, yeah. There's lots of reasons why that one thread could, could take a break for a while. So what happens here is what happens to head? Head can't go on, right? Because that one guy, that one guy has stopped head from moving on. Uh, all, the can, all the producers can keep going. So here's my question, is that lock free? So to answer the question, you have to know what the definition of lock free is. Um, and basically, you know, we're still imagining that pop has this, maybe an if or maybe a while of saying, I can't go forward if, you know, if, if, the, if tail is still holding me back. Um, I like to call it block free because that's why I put this code up here. There's no lock. There's no like standard lock, unique lock, whatever. But there's a block, right? This guy can't move forward. Even though he's not using a standard lock, he's using a spin lock or he's just doing it. Maybe he just does an if he returns back to the guy calling him saying, there's nothing there yet. And there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but I can't see it. So as far as I'm concerned, nothing's there. He returns. What's the guy he returns to going to do? He's probably going to you know, calculate pi for a while, then call you again. Like, so, you know, you're stuck. You can't read anything. So anyhow, is this lock free? An algorithm is lock free if at all times, at least one thread is guaranteed, be, guaranteed to be making progress. That's the Hurley-He definition. Hurley-He and Chavitz and um, Meyer, probably a few other people. Um, This this is my yeah this is my point. There are there is threads there are threads making progress. Those those producer threads are making progress, sort of, like they're making progress. But at the end of the day, if we never consume what they produced, we're kind of not making progress. So.
So my definition of lock free is slightly different. It's my definition is if I suspend one of your threads at the worst possible time, like just that one spot, and bad things happen, then it's not lock free, right? So that's that idea of I should be able to kill any one of your threads in a lock free program in a lock free design, and everyone else <laughs> is fine. It should not cause problems. So in my mind, this is not lock free. So that's why. I pick this version over that version. Uh, does that answer that question? No. Why do I think, why do I have this on here? Very strange. Ah, no. Same, yes, Chandler? I just wanted to say that the term is block free. Well, that's what I start calling it, block free. But, but you know, it used to be called lock free. Non-blocking algorithms, thank you. There's weight-free, lock-free. Non-blocking means that a failure of suspension of any thread does not cause these systems to uh, fail. Yeah, okay. Um, I think what I want to point out is the same problem exists here. If a thread gets paused when we're trying to update, I guess I've already said that, right? If a thread pauses while we're trying to update, uh, we're, the, you know, the, the consumers are screwed. That's why this is a, be is a better choice than that one. The same reason why it, the system is currently not, not lock free. This is not lock free. This version is lock free. If we can fix the other problems. That's so, yeah. That's not lock free. This is getting closer to being lock free. So that's why we picked that one. So let's try to fix this problem. Um, now I am going to use the CAS version that updates temp when it fails, which is really sad because then I have to do a check. Because if it failed, I really wish it would have, even whether it passed or failed, I really wish I knew what tail was. <laughs> the thing is, if it passes, it's like you already know what tail is, you just said it. But it's kind of ugly piece of code there. Um, why is this better? So we come in, ah. No. Um, I think that's just a different way of writing it. I just wanted to change the way I was writing it. Um, so basically, we have this problem of it's not lock free, right? I'm trying really hard here to get something that's lock free, and it's not. So this is where I work. The important picture here is not the building, it is the forest over there. When I'm trying to solve problems like this, I walk through the forest. Um, and until I made these slides, I've never drawn diagrams of my lock free queue. It's always just been in my head. And my rule basically is if you can't fit it in your head, you've got too many variables and too many states, right? The problem with lock free programming is, you know, states, all your states have to be good. Well, how many states can you manage at a time, right? I can manage like one or two, head and tail, buffer, you know, like a couple of states. I can keep that in my head. So I can go for a walk and think about this problem and imagine it all in my head. So, you know, we've got this thing. It's not lock free. Let's clear our mind, clear the diagram. What are we going to do about this? Um, the basic problem is that head has to wait for this one guy, but we don't want him to wait. So what are we going to do? Let's not wait. <laughs> What, what is, you, know, you go out to the forest, everything becomes clear to you, don't wait. So we just skip right past that guy and we go to the next one, all right? And then it's like, okay, I tell you what, I'll come back later and get that guy who's not ready yet. But I know there's other stuff there, you know, I can go look ahead and say, there are things in the queue, just there's somebody in my way, get on my way, I'm getting these other, other things out of the queue. And we'll split head the same way we split tail so that we can come back later. <laughs> ordering relationships. We've got one problem. What if everyone has reserved their spots, but no one has written yet? You know, probably not going to happen, but these things happen. So head is going to go along, and he's going to go through, and he's like, there's nobody ready. Like, there's all this spot, but there's nobody there. And he's just going to keep spinning and spinning, waiting for something to show up. So in this case, the queue really is empty, right? So 
this is a spin lock, right? And you can decide whether this is okay or not to spin waiting for something to show up. But it's not just a nice little tight spin lock. It's a spin lock that's reading who knows how much memory, all atomics, looking for something to be there. So it's a really, really ugly, bad spin lock. Um, so the ordering problem. Head comes in, he sees the first thing is zero. That's all he can see, right? He can only see one thing at a time. He goes and he sees B. Oh, there's something in the next location. Great. Let's pop that. Goes along, he sees C. Awesome. Pop that. And he keeps going along until he gets to the end. And eventually he'll come back and say, oh, A's there now. Great. Pop A. Is that okay? Basically, these things got pushed. Is there an order to how they got pushed? Maybe. Maybe. Hmm. Right? If they're all different threads pushing these things, there was no order. Whoever got there, like, what does it mean to get there first? Oh, Well, now, now let's not even worry about, like, it's hard for you externally to tell. It's really hard for you to tell. I mean, if you just, if you know all your other threads are dead or something like that, or you've, you know, they're locked on something, but it's actually hard for you to tell if you have multiple threads, they both called into a function, did they pause right after they got into the function, right? But, so I'm imagining these three threads are all different threads writing these values. So there was no real order for who got in there first. And they're all coming out from different threads anyhow, so who cares? But let's do this one more time. And say, we start, we see a zero, great. We see an A primed. Then we see an A double primed. And then we go back and we do A. And my point is that these are all red. They're all A's. They all came from thread A. That can't happen? Because this is the one that's advancing the tail, right? The red thread was waiting to write A. He can't make progress until A is written. And so you can't ever get a situation where the same thread, that's what I was saying, you can't ever get a situation where the same thread wrote A prime but didn't get to write A. But well, you can have a situation where there's an external synchronization between the Okay, the green. wait. So, you can't get the situation where thread A wrote A primed before he wrote A. Yeah. Completely agree. Yet you can get this. <laughs> because when I came here, all I know is no one has written anything yet. Maybe B has reserved this spot. Maybe A has, maybe, who knows what happened? All I know is nothing's happened yet. When I go here, if you look really closely, I can see it from here, A is there already. <laughs> and it's high, like it's just, there's a little bit of A there, and there's an A prime there. They are there. Yeah, so the, the sequence got written in the right order. You just wasn't there when you looked, and then the whole sequence was there when you looked at the next one. Thanks for asking, because obviously that's subtle, right? So you can still ask the question, who cares, right? If these are all coming out of different threads, maybe this is just like, do some work on a bunch of threads, go do the work. You're not, ex you know, the guy who pushed these, if they're getting popped by different threads, he doesn't expect any order of this. Right? Because these are all different threads from those threads. But maybe it's not. I just wrote this code. I don't know how many threads you're using on this side. Maybe you only have one thread on this side. So now you have the case of, I know this one thread pushed these in a certain order, and this one thread popped them in the other order, right? And still at the end of the day, you can say, look, this is a multi-threaded whatever queue. I don't give you that guarantee. Deal with it. Don't use it this way, whatever. Just don't assume things go in, come out the same order you put them in. Maybe you're okay with that. I'm, I'm not sure I'm okay with that, right? So I'm going to try to not do that. And maybe you're using this as a single-threaded you know, queue, which is really dumb. Well, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you, um, and maybe it's just right now it's only one thread, and then later on in your program it's more threads, that's why you're using, you know, there could be reasons why temporarily there's only one thread involved. So I don't want the behavior in the single thread case to be different than a normal queue, probably. Here's my other problem. Go back to the simple case of all different threads. I pop B, I pop C, I pop A, because they were out of order, and then I go back, you know, I, I do A last, and then I go through. How do I know? 
I didn't already pop B. Right, zero. Right, zero. <laughs> Go for a walk. Try to solve this problem. Um, actually, what I want to do instead is screw it. Throw out the whole idea of having this tail with two edges to it. Because as someone else mentioned, the buffer itself is geek has got a lot of information. It knows where the head is. It knows where the tail is. Why am I asking these other guys? Why are they trying to maintain this information? So what I really like is that zero. I like the zero. I'm, I'm keeping the zero idea. So, you know, 159 slides in, throw out all the work we just did. Feel the pain? This is how it works. So this is what we have. You know, start over. We've got a, a queue like this. We've got two threads racing in on this queue again. But now they're not going to race on tail. They're going to race on the buffer itself. And they will race with a CAS. One of them will win and set the value there, and the other one will lose. Right? So B gets set, B wins, A's the loser. What's A going to do? Well, A's going to try again. Right? So he'll go back up, he'll reread tail, hopefully tail is moving, and see if he can go there. If tail hasn't moved yet, he'll just stomp on the same spot over and over trying to, to get it. So we're always reloading tail, hoping that it's, someone's moved it along. So. A is waiting for tail to move. Once again, if B dies, A thread will wait forever. So we can't quite just do that. Ah. Uh, if CAS fails, try then try again. I've got another then statement. Oh, I got two then statements. Sorry. Read tail, then read buffer. You know, and that's a then statement on two atomics, two shared variables. So I can't know what tail is when I read buffer, even though I just read it. So all I'm trying to figure out is, is there a zero here? You know, did B win or is there still a zero there? It's getting kind of complicated. Uh, what happens in this, you know, this is, this is where we're at. We're just trying to check for that, that, that zero. Um, What happens if he's right here, he's about to read this value, the queue looks like this. Between those two lines of code, the whole queue looks like that. From, from one line to the next, the whole queue has flown by. And like we mentioned, someone mentioned before, it's like, why don't we use zeros to say things have been, you know, have been taken care of or something like that. So now, B comes in and goes, hey, it's zero, great. Or A, I can write there. Awesome. Not awesome. So what are we going to do? And by the way, why are there trailing zeros? I've got a chicken and egg problem, like I mentioned, of I can't show you push until I show you pop, and I can't show you pop until I show you push. So just imagine that pop is probably the guy who's putting the trailing zeros there for some good reason. I mean, basically at the end of the day, pop is going to look like the opposite of push in a, in a great, in a lot of sense, right? But the trailing zeros are causing us a problem that we can't tell where we are in the queue anymore. So, you know what? Let's compromise. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put ones in there, right? So now I know I can tell the difference between nothing's ever been here, things are here, things are gone. And now looking at the same, I can see where head and tail is very clearly just by looking at the buffer. I can't look at it all at once. <laughs> I can only look at one spot at a time, but Conceptually, I could see what's going on. <coughs> Did I mention this is a circular queue? I probably didn't mention that, but obviously, even though my tail value can go off forever, basically, uh, memory is not infinite. So I'm going to have to recycle this buffer. And uh, I'm going to go for a walk again, because I have to think about this. Right? So we got this diagram that has been stuck on the board the whole time, right? It's the same diagram. It's burnt into my retinas. But this is really the diagram. I was lying all along, right? This is what, like, you know, conceptually, I love the look of that, but this is what's really, what's really there, so it's time to look at the real diagram. And we got the case where it kind of looks like this, and it feels nice. You can see what's going on. Um, okay. Yeah, 
just, you know, I don't need to see where head and tail are or anything else. I can just look at the diagram and see the state of my queue. And I've got this problem again. And the problem is solved because I see a one there when I'm trying to find a zero. But this case that we had doesn't really look like this. It looks like this, right? And then eventually the queue is going to look like this. And now I got the same problem with I had with zeros. I've got ones everywhere. <laughs> How am I going to solve that problem? Okay, listen. You know, positive numbers are not really that important. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of negative numbers. We only put negative numbers into our queue. And here we're going to, you know, ones, we'll make those twos, right? And because this is a queue that circles around, eventually we'll have fours and we'll have fives. All the, you know, positive numbers are taken. If you want to be a sinist, you know, you can say you like positive numbers better than negative numbers. You can pretend these are all negatives and you only put positive numbers into your queue. But I'm not, you know, I'm not into sinism. I'm, positive numbers and negative numbers are, 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 you know, equally valid in my mind as a mathematician. Um, so we've really compromised here, but uh, we, we still have problems. It's kind of nice that we, we solve the problem of, of seeing the difference between these two, but this code is way old now. It's still looking for a zero. It's like, pfft, zero's long gone, man. We're on four and five or 20 something. So great, the good thing is, you know, if you still imagine that this guy was looking for a zero, the CAS will fail because it's now, you know, it's spun around four times and it's on a four. But even later, he'll never, you know, when he, get, when he, when he retries, he's going to come here. He can't still be looking for zeros. He's got to start looking for fours sooner or later. So was this hard code of, hard code of four in there? No, I don't think that works. Um, what we're going to have to do is have a generation, right, inside of our structure that keeps track of how many times have we gone around this queue. And... Ah, that's another atomic, right? I really don't like yet another atomic, yet another piece of state that I have to worry about. More state. More thens, <laughs> you know. More state leads to more thens. I don't like that idea. So what we're going to do is go hide the generation somewhere. We're going to make another compromise. Stick the generation count inside the tail. So if tail was a 64-bit value, half of it is generation count and half of it's uh, this never-ending number, which now is never-ending earlier. You could probably argue that you don't want to split the bits equally, 32, 32. It might be like 48 bits of distance and 16 bits of, of generation because, you know, it's, it's the, the generation count is to solve, I'm just trying to put a value in here did the whole queue get, f get f fold filled 16 times over or, you know, uh, 65,000 times? Or, you know, like all these crazy, how many items did I put in the queue for that to rotate around? So the generation count doesn't have to be too many bits. Um, and now you can imagine that index, which, which, which was just a, uh, you know, the tail index thing is, is now a class. It's got some smarts in it and it puts the two values together can get the generation out of it, uh, overloads operator plus plus to only increment the one half, stuff like that. Imagine that magic's wherever it needs to be. So now the nice part is, is when I load tail, I get a better snapshot of what's going on. I know where tail is, and I also know what generation we're on from one atomic read. I don't have to do two reads that aren't synchronous, you know, that I don't have thens to worry about. I get one read, I see what's going on. And now, when I, after the read and tail has moved along, and I try to write here, it fails, right? Because this is not a, f you know, this value is not a four. And if, when I try to do my read, it's looking like this, it still fails, right? Awesome. Even if it comes around like this, and actually, at this line, if temp happens to be in the same spot as tail, which we'd actually like to pass, it still fails, right? Because it's like, the generation count doesn't match. Even though it was the right spot, the CAS will fail in this case as well. But my claim is the only cases you have to worry about in this CAS are the case where it passes, that it is in this spot, and there's a four there like you wanted, or it fails because it looks like this, or it fails because it looked like that. Those are the only states of the queue. 
if we can maintain our invariance of the queue is always contiguous, you know, circularly contiguous kind of thing, there are no other diagrams I can draw that I have to worry about. And that I even took care of this case, which isn't important, but you know. So that's what I mean by all states are valid for all lines of code. For, for at least this one line of code, all states of the queue are valid. Okay. So let's say the CAS succeeded because nothing else was going on and we've got our A stuck in there. Now we're going to increment tail again. We still have this problem of cleaning up tail. Should the guy who succeeded increment tail? Maybe between this line and that line, right there, uh, maybe tail has gone off. Should you still be the guy incrementing it? And the other question is, do we have a spin lock, again, waiting for the guy to increment tail. One of the other threads to increment tail, and I'm just spinning. Let's take care of all these problems. Let's remove tail. <laughs> Let's remove tail. I would almost like to remove tail, but we can't. Um, which part do I want to talk about first? Uh, that probably gets rid of the spin lock. How much time do I have left? 20 minutes. I'm going to go a little faster. Let's pretend that gets rid of the spin lock. Um, and I'm going to say, well, we got that same problem of, you know, so instead of waiting for a tail, this guy's going to go forward looking for tail, right? Looking for an empty spot. Tail's not necessarily the right thing. I'll just go looking forward. Um, and then eventually I'll find the right spot, whether tail's been updated or not. And then again, we have these same, these, these while loops are the same maybe I can uh, bring these while loops together because they're comparing the same value. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do something different. Uh, Herb gave a talk on atomic weapons, which I like to call atomic weapons of mass destruction, um, where he said never use relaxed atomics, right? Because atomics and lock-free is hard enough already. Use sequential consistency. At least you can kind of reason about your code. Don't use relaxed because it, it gets you know, exponentially harder. So let's use relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> so I claim that I can load tail relaxed and I can search the buffer for the right spot relaxed. But when I write the buffer, I'm going to do a full, no, actually I don't need full, I need a release, a release offense or a memory order here, but whatever. I'll do a full thing there. Those can be relaxed. So like you're saying, let's get rid of tail. Tail is just a hint. <coughs> tail is like, the spot you want is somewhere around here. Go look for it. Start here, and then go look for it. Right? It's never over here. It's either here or ahead. Right? So that's why tail, there's no other data depending on tail. Tail is just a hint, so we can use relaxed atomics on it, which is awesome because relaxed atomics, especially like on x86, is basically as fast as just a normal read, right? Because the integers happen to be uh, a, a aligned and locked uh, atomic on their own atomic read. Um, so both of those, and also reading the buffer now, we're not doing an atomic, you know, a, a heavy atomic read on every item in the buffer looking for the empty spot. We're doing a quick, we're just running through a buffer looking for a number. That's normal code. And I'm going to claim that this guy, uh, what am I claiming here? Basically, I'm going to claim that, yes, we still have to increment tail because someone's got to do it. Otherwise, tail will constantly be left behind. But we're not just going to increment tail by one. We can actually, we'd like to just set tail to where we found it, right? It's like we've gone through the trouble of finding tail. Let's set it. Of course, there's other people who've also gone through the trouble of finding tail at the same time, possibly, so we can't exactly just set it. We have to cas it, right? So basically what we say is, we've tail started here, we went searching, we found that tail is there. If tail, this says if tail is still in that same spot where we started, meaning no one else has changed it, then we can update tail to, the, to its most recent location. And then, I don't know how many people understand the ABA problem, but what we're trying to say here is, tail hasn't changed, right? That's what this CAS is trying to say. Tail used to be that. It's still that. It must not have changed. In general, lock-free programming, that's not quite true. What might have happened is tail had a value 
change to a different value, then change back to your original value. That's the ABA problem. It happens a lot in, in node-based things because you have a node, you release that node, you allocate a node, or, and the allocator gives you the same node back that you just had a second ago, and you think these two pointers aren't equal, and they turn out they, they, they are equal. Because again, memory's not infinite, so the allocator has to give you the same pointer back sooner or later. Um, but we said that tail is always increasing, so we'll never get the ABA problem here. Another good reason to increase tail. And now the question is, after we go through all this trouble, we started here, we found the tail was here, we said no one else is touching tail, so we can update it to here, and then right after that cast statement, is tail up to date now? Now is in quotes. What the world does now mean in, in multi-threaded programming? It means nothing. All I can say is that on this instruction, tail was updated, but after this instruction, tail might have already fallen behind again. It's a better hint than it used to be. It's a better hint than it used to be. It's closer to where it was. Um, and in fact, I guess walking through that, this is exactly what happens. This succeeds. You know, we come up to the CAS and we're just we're, we we increment the CAS to put tail in the right spot, but suddenly someone else. Where did this guy come from? <coughs> Bam! There's someone else there already. The tail is already out of date. Doesn't matter. It's closer. Tail's closer to where we wanted it. So again, setting tail could be relaxed because it doesn't matter, as long as it's nearby. <sighs> Are all states valid for all lines of code? Is this okay? What about this state? Our queue is almost full. What about this state? Our queue is full. I said that you could just look at the diagram and see where head and tail are. Not quite. You can't see where head and tail are. You know, maybe it's right there. There's head, and tail is maybe hanging around here somewhere because it's off. And maybe tail is actually in the right spot, but, you know, basically the queue is so full that tail is going, the next free spot will be here once it becomes available. But the queue is full. So we need to do something about that. Oh, and it seems like we have another spin lock in here. Yeah, this guy is looking for the empty spot to put, to, to put tail at. There is no empty spot for tail. So that code will go around forever looking for where to put tail. Eventually, it'll find a spot, hopefully, because someone will open up a spot, and that will be the right spot. But it's running the whole buffer forever until a spot opens up. That's kind of ugly. Hey, why don't we compromise? Um, right, we also have an overflow problem because now temp is incrementing forever and it's spinning around this thing. Who knows how long it's going to stay full? How long does it take to increment just an integer, 32-bit integer? How long does it take to increment that and have it overflow? Let's say you're trying, it's a 32-bit integer. How long does it take to count to 4 gig on a 4 gig processor? Under a, second. a 4 gigahertz processor counting to 4 gig? Maybe it takes a, sec takes a second because it does... It's faster. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it's just doing that one thing. Yeah. Yeah, multiple interest structures at the same time. Um, but, you know, you can imagine that could only take a second. It's also reading the whole buffer, so it's going to take longer. But still, you can't let that overflow. So, oh my god. Let's make another compromise. We'll put a bit inside the answer, the inside the actual values. So we've taken our only negative integers and made them smaller and said, It'll keep track of whether the generation that they put them in there is odd or even. So then when tail comes by and it crosses this line, it'll go from odd to even. Anyone okay with that? Of course, the problem there is if it, the whole thing wrapped around twice while you're waiting, you're back to even again. So that's, that's not really a good thing. Um, and we were worried about the spin lock and we were worried about going over. So let's not let temp go over. Once you've gone once around, you know you've gone the distance of the queue. Stop there. Get out. I mean, right now we're doing the CAS again. It's probably going to fail. But we'll go back. We'll reread tail and we'll try again. But we're still spinning on full. But at least we're not uh, overflowing temp. Ah, that's, that's on full, right? So spinning on full, maybe that's okay because you're waiting for a spot to go. What about this case? It's not full at all. There's only four items in the queue. And we come in and we try to see, you know, temp is trying to find tail. So it's here, it goes, oh, tail's not here. Goes to the next spot, says tail's not there. Go
goes to the next boss, his tail's not there, right? Because the queue keeps moving along at the same rate as you looking for it, which is probably not true because this guy is relaxed atomics and is moving faster than the whole queue is pushing things, but it might happen. So it's spin locking even when it's not full, which is scary. So it gets so complicated that at some point you're just going to say, it looks full to me. I've looked for a tail. Maybe I, you know, I looked for a while. I said, I don't see it. I'll reread tail, see if I can find it again. You know, I'm looking all over this queue. At some point you're just going to go, I don't know if it's full. I'm going to claim that it's full. Right? And why is that OK? Because we still have this problem of you know, your normal if statements work like that. The state doesn't change. But what about this? Even if I could return correctly that it's full, what am I going to do with that information? It might be empty right after I found out that it really was full. So if I lie and say I think it's full, that's not so bad. Because it, maybe it was full. It's not full now. Another way to solve this problem is put a spot in here that you never fill. right? Just have a marker of these guys can overlap. Now I can look at the thing and I can see, you know, steal another value. I can see when we're, when we're up against the end of the queue. But as the queue moves along, you'll have to be always updating that value, all, not just updating the real, the real values. Um, like that, you know, you'll have to always carry that thing around and then stop if you find it. Um, let me try and move a little faster. The other way to do it is just never, never be full. Always leave one spot and check for is the next tail you know, equal to head, right? Because tail is wrapping around and meeting head. But I already said tail always increases forever, so it's not really this check, it's this check, right? The, the, the wrapped tail mod, the size is bumping up against the where head is in the queue. So maybe one of those works, right? Maybe you'll return fullish even when it's not full, but that's OK. What are we going to do when it's full? We'll wait. Wait for space. And then after that, when we come back, we'll have to start over again. So what's wait for space, space do? It grabs a lock, and it checks again if it's still full, and waits for someone to tell them it's not full anymore. It's a lock-free thing with a lock in it. That's OK, because it's full. Right? You're trying to push something into a full queue. Either you can return, hey, it's full, go figure out what to do, or you can say, stop right there, sleep, not spin around looking for a spot, just waste no resources, wait until someone tells you that it's full. And this still fullish will probably be using the same code as find tail, um, which means this wait for space will probably be taking these values so that you know, once we found the tail, we'll get updated values, and that's just kind of a little optimization. The real question is, who's going to notify that the queue's not full anymore, right? The pusher, the producer, has said, this queue is full. I'm going to wait for someone to tell me it's not full. So who, t who tells me it's not full? The, the consumer, the pop, right? Pop, at some point, is going to say, hey, I, I, I emptied the spot for you. You can get, get going now. Yes? The latency we've seen someone calling notify and you actually waking up from the notify? I have no idea. Um, there, there is, uh, you know, along those lines, there probably is a thing where you might want to spin lock for a while and then go, no, it really looks like nothing's going on. I'm going to go to sleep. Like, that's a common thing, right? Like, even, even in uh, even Windows critical sections do that. They spin on the thing for a while and go, I don't know, I'm going to go in the kernel and sleep for a while. Yeah? Yeah. But it may not be actually large relative to the rest of your program. Yeah. But it, it's not going to matter because this is sort of the corner case. And yeah. as Tony said, you can sort of do some heuristic where you spin for a while. And a lot of spin locks will have this where they'll spin and then they'll back off. Yeah. That's so, sort of the correct way to do it. He knows a lot of this stuff. Um, 
yeah, that's a lot heavier weight than the atomic operations. It might not be much compared to what else you're doing. You know, you're producing stuff, you're consuming stuff, you're doing real work somewhere, you're not just calculating pi somewhere. So it's, you know, probably want to do some, you know, you, you tried, you tried to find the tail, you tried really hard, and then you gave up and said, I'm going to wait. Yes? I actually would think that almost the more correct thing to do would be to just sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Just I mean, oh. I, I, I would, I mean, the way that I would do it is just, you know. Sleep for a while and wake up? Yeah, I'd spin for 64 iterations, then sleep. Yeah, you could just leave. I don't know. I just don't like it. I like this for purity. If you're full because you're blocked on I.O. or something, that's sleep. The, the, but the if, you're, if you're using a key like this, I mean, presumably you're, you're using this in a part of the code where you don't mind sort of being a little bit, um, uh, be, being I, a little bit live. I'm going to go, go forward. Sleeping might be better. Depends on, you know, what you're doing. To me, this is the more pure theoretical way of doing it. It's like, I'm going to sleep until someone tells me, instead of just looking again. And Pop's the guy who's going to tell me. Here's the question. Is Pop going to grab the lock to call notify? Because this is how you're supposed to call notify. Right? You don't have to, but people recommend this. Because <sighs> I tell you, you don't want to grab a lock on every Pop. This is supposed to be lock free. Yes? Spurious wake-ups happen. This is why we have this extra find check in here. But no, I'll show you why there's a difference here. Say we come in, the queue is full. It really is full. You know, This guy did the right thing. He found the queue is full. He's checked one last time. He's grabbed the lock. He's checked. The queue really is full. I'm going to go wait. All right? And he's right there. He's just about to wait. On the next line of code, the queue is empty. Bam. Whole queue is empty. What happened? How did this queue get empty? Pop came along and called notify, you know, 17 times. And all those notifies were lost because I wasn't quite waiting yet. So now the queue is empty. Then I go and wait. And Pop is never going to tell me that it's empty. Pop is probably going to do the same thing and go wait for the queue to get full again, like for something to show up. Nothing's going to show up because everyone's waiting. Maybe not everybody, but worst case, they're all waiting. So we can't just do this. We have to grab the lock. Once we grab the lock, you know, we can't get this lock until that guy's in the wait. Then I can grab my lock. Then I can notify. Notifies won't get lost. So I've got a lock inside of push. Or pop. Every, you know, every time through pop. Yes? What about a compromise between both of those? A, a, a timed, timed wait? A timed wait, maybe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show, you know, I'm going to go for a walk and think about it for a while. Maybe I'll do a timed wait after the walk. Um, I really don't want to lock all the time, right? So what I'm going to do is set a flag first saying, I'm waiting. Okay? Just, I'm going to go wait now. It's not really true that I'm waiting it's that I'm going to go wait, right? Because I haven't, met, maybe not waited yet, but I'm going to go wait. And pop, this pop code, we said we have to use this one to fit it on the screen. I'm going to move it up there, okay? So pop can go, well, if you're waiting, then I'll grab the lock, and then I'll notify you. And then you're like, that's a little tricky. Is that okay? Waiting's in the wrong spot? Waiting has to be after you grab the lock. Um, and someone has to set the waiting back to false. Someone definitely has to set waiting back to false. We'll do that after. I'll have to think about your other question of whether waiting is in the right spot or not. So waiting is it atomic? Waiting is it atomic or not? That's a good question. Pretend for now it's atomic. Okay, well, and it's not. It, it's it's not um, just a bool anymore too because we could have lots of people waiting. So we'll have to do that, right? Now, the problem is, this happens rarely. We rarely have a full queue. Really, we should never have a full queue. Like, why haven't you balanced your workers and stuff? Like, um, but we're always checking that atomic. Every time. <sighs> I don't want to do that, right? So, as it turns out, you're doing other atomic operations. You know, at so I don't know what Pop's doing yet, because we haven't seen Pop. But I 
guarantee it's going to try to update head sometime. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to take that waiting variable and stick it inside of head. Just the bit to say, yes, somebody, at least one person is waiting. So then when you do the CAS on head, for free, you read the wait bit. You know, you get a copy of the wait bit. And then you can say, someone was waiting or was about to wait. So you better do the magic you know, thing of doing the lock and notifying. And this guy has both things. He's got his waiting plus plus, and he sets the wait bit. And then he's the last guy, he clears the wait bit. Now, as your people were wondering, waiting is no longer atomic. Waiting only is changed inside the lock. But the wait bit on head is atomic. Right? We've stolen one bit out of head. So I'm still somewhat uncomfortable with this code. I'll, I'll tell you that. I think I've got it right. Um, this was the case I was trying to think of today. Of uh, You've set wait bit. You're not waiting yet. This guy comes in. He sees that you're waiting, even though you're not really. And he sets the notify because the queue is no longer full. That's kind of OK, because you're still going to check again that the queue is no longer full. As long as this find, you know, is the queue full thing, as long as it can tell that the queue, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect of is the queue full or not. It just has to be able to tell the queue's not really empty. That's not hard. Just is the queue empty? No, you know. Um, as long as the queue, he can see that the queue is empty or there's some spot in the queue, he will fall out before he waits and we'll be okay. And I'll leave it as exercise to you to figure out whether there's any other worrisome spots in there. Um, but we did that extra fine tail, which should solve the problem of losing that notify. So what are, what are the semantics of the queue? <laughs> Does the reader and writer know the size of the queue? And can they depend on the length of that queue? The reader and writer know the size of the queue. Well, okay. Sorry, the reader and the writer internally know the size of the queue. Ex externally. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me just repeat the question first of all. The question is if the external users of this thing know that the max size of the queue is 100 or whatever and you happen to be using one thread, that one thread could go, I'm going to fill the queue, and then I'm going to empty the queue. You know? But when he goes to fill the queue, he's actually going to end up waiting, and he'll never get around to emptying the queue, because it's one thread doing both parts. I'll basically say I never thought of this yet. Um, I, in my head, I've always figured that you should be able, the real API will allow you to do either. When you say, when you say push and when you say pop, you should be able to say, if it's not available, should I wait or should I return? So. In, in that case, if you want that behavior, then you'll return when it's full instead of waiting for it to, for a spot. Yeah, maybe you can't rely on filling the queue. That's, it, it depends on how well you can write the fullish and fine tail. I'm kind of glossed over it, you know. Question? We're, we're, we're at the end of time, but. Yeah, they can all come in, they all check the wait bit, they all do notifies, and all those notifies get lost because the queue is empty. Is that what you're saying? Well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but say the, say the uh, consumers, they check the head for the wait The bit. consumers check wait bit. It's not set. It's not set. Because the producers haven't, haven't quite waited yet. But Yeah, actually, that's, I mean, before I had waiting before the lock. And now I put waiting af after the lock. And the, the, the set bit is before. I might, I might have to change the order of those. Um, as I said, this is like I haven't thought through every possibility of this code yet. Don't you also 
will have a problem that on the left side head can change uh, at any time and <coughs> then you have checked the wrong weight bit? Well, I mean, head can change at any time, but the, the, the head variable, I mean, it's one variable in the thing. As it moves along, it's going to have to maintain that bit. Okay. Um, uh, I just had another thought there. Um, oh, well, we're out of time anyhow. And look at that. We're walking out of the forest. We turn around and look at where we were in the forest. And we notice that there's poison ivy sign. This is, this is like, the first few times I walked through this forest, I didn't notice this. And one day I walked in the opposite direction. And I was like, oh, there's poison ivy in the forest that I walked through. But you know, stay on the path. It's OK. Um, so looking back, what have we done so far on this queue? We've done push in you know, almost 300 slides to do push. We're probably not really comfortable whether it's right or not yet. Um, we tried things. They all failed. We tried other things. We threw things away and started over. This is how you write lock-free code. And then you sit for days or hours staring at the code, wondering if, you know, is this right or not? Um, looking ahead, my original title was, I mean, now it's just called the complicated lock free queue. My original title was a growing, shrinking, multi-producer, multi-consumer lock free queue. And not just a Vince. Um, so this diagram has been on every slide, except for the forest. I am finally moved the di move it down to save some pixels from burning out. This is the queue I want. When we get full, we put a marker and we allocate another buffer. Right? And when that buffer gets full, we allocate another buffer, twice the size each time. And really, if you're using queues, I don't know if this is a good idea. Because that means you know something's probably wrong if you're just pushing into this queue forever and no one's pulling out the other side. But hey, you know, I wanted to see if I could write a growing and shrinking lock-free queue. Growing's not so hard. Shrinking it again, you have to know, not only is there nothing left in this buffer, is there any thread in the buffer looking for something, you know? So you're going to have a ref count on each of the buffers to say, is there a thread in there? Which is another atomic operation. So don't, you know, don't give any of the impression that this is any of this is fastest way to do something. You know, you might end up with how many atomic operations does it take to do a push? Too many, probably, right? But I, I just want to see if it happens. So this is a vector, you know, hard, you know, in my header, my, in my structure will be like, if I had 32 entries, that means I can do two to the, the top buffer is two to the 32. I, you know, I don't need that many. But whatever size this is, it's fixed. There's just a few entries for a new allocation. There's a pointer saying the new allocation's there. And next time, we'll start from here and we'll try to build this. And we get into problems of, you know, when two people see this as full or maybe full, and they go over here, do they both try to allocate? We have another race on allocation. Uh, and then trying to trying to get smaller instead of bigger, and then trying to do more than just ints because we're now down to only negative ints of 31 bits or 17, 16 bits or 14 bits left in our ints. So I'd like to do structures, and the way I want to do structures is you have a, yet another buffer is where the real structure goes, and all these ints here are just indexes into the buffer, and that's why you know what's the max size of that. So, but. When we get to here, the forest starts getting darker. Yeah, we're out of time. Forest starts getting a little darker. Winter is coming. It's not, but uh, it gets slippery and dangerous. That's OK, because in Canada, you play hockey on ice with trees in the way. <laughs> people wonder why Canadians are so good at hockey. There's an, the other net's like hiding back there somewhere. So people, like, people really play hockey there. It's like. Anyhow, uh, this is the end of the slides. The one thing about this, someone you look this up, the Ptolemy Project, uh, the problem with threads. A Ptolemy Project was uh, by Berkeley. It's a, a kernel that they wrote. And they tried to do all the best engineering practices, code review, design review, nightly builds, regression tests, code coverage, automation, everything. Do it all right, you know? Maybe they didn't have fuzzing and, you know, who knows what they had when they did this, but they, you know, at the time, 2000, they did it all perfectly. For the kernel, for the important parts, they got experts to come in and look at this. And this thing ran for four years before one day it deadlocked. 
four years before they found a deadlock in the kernel because it had a bug. <laughs> That's a lot like what lock-free coding is like. You think you got it right, how do you test it? We're starting to get tools to test it, but it's really hard to test lock-free programming. You can only look at it and try to prove ability, <laughs> mathematically prove that it's right. Uh, testing doesn't get you too far, although it's getting better. All states are valid for all lines of code. That's my last. That's it. Any, I mean, we're out of time. You can ask me questions. You can ask me questions later, but that's it. Thank you.